Stevie again. Look what we have here. I have a Kenmore 1040. Look, even the book. So let's see what we got going on here. I want to play with it. And you want to watch me play with it? I got a half a cup of coffee left. It's still early. Got some music going, kind of halfway. Let's do a checklist to make sure that we're in good shape for sewing. So I got a machine. I got a book. Some bobbins. Lots of thread everywhere. Scraps of material. Things to work with. Let's see the dishes. Nope, they're not done. Nails. Eh. So let's tear into it and see what we got. Okay, so I brought you a lot closer because the case, we got to get this thing out of here. I mean, it's got this beautiful plastic, sturdy rose handle or rose covered case. So we got to get it out of here. And to do that, you're going to flip that down. And there's two on either side. Look at that guy right there. See? And then there's some push buttons here that you have to push, and a whole case will open forward. These act like, uh, you know, secure safety locks so it doesn't fall out. And interesting enough, the bottom of the machine is actually the bottom of the case with those little rubber feet. And as you can see, it's a, uh, you know, 158. 1040, patent pending. They never did patent these machines. This is one of the one amp models. I'm gonna push my buttons. Let me push back on my case. Look at that. We'll just get rid of that. We'll just set that to the side. We don't need it anymore. So, as you can see, I got a nice little pedal stuffed in here. Get that on the wrap. Oh boy, oh boy. Throw that down here on the ground. We're gonna need that. And this has got to be my favorite pedal. This is the uh, double carbon pile. You can always tell by the shape and the type. Uh, every machine I own has this on it. I even put one of these on my brother's serger. I convert all of my machines that are non-Kenmore to this standard. I, I really like this pedal. I wish they made a pedal as nice as this that's electronic. That's my only complaint is after three, four hours of sewing, it does get hotter than Hades. But it's time to take a break anyways if that happens. As you can see, this one's missing one of its little rubber feeties. Won't hurt it. So we'll just throw that down here. And plug the machine in. Okay. And if you look at the connector, you'll notice that it's a three-pin connector. Most portable Kenmore standards use this, especially the 158. You'll notice that the spacing between two pins is larger than the other two. And that's so you can't plug it in backwards. So there we go. We got it plugged in. And like most typical 158s, it actually has a power button. And there we are. We're plugged in. We are ready to sell. And then I'm going to switch the power button on it. I like my super bright 5 million little LED light bulbs. I get these from a vendor. They're fairly inexpensive and they are daylight bright. Here, I'm going to flip this on just so you can see how bright they are because I'm, you know, I'm getting old, getting blind. See how bright that is? And I always try to get one that just peeks out the bottom because if you get one that peeks out the bottom, it lights the entire bed. So, first thing first, I have no thread. We've got to get some thread. And one of the things that I do like about the Kenmores is the pop-up spool pin. Packs down nice and neat, so that way you don't bust it off on accident. Pretty typical old spool winder for Kenmore. Nothing overly fancy. And then, of course, the hand wheel is kind of interesting. It actually has two pieces here. And you loosen that up to disengage the machine from the motor and wind a bobbin. Just read the instructions. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take our thread that I put on my fancy spool stand here, or a spool pin. 
We're going to run it between this tension, make sure it goes all the way up in there. And I'm going to take it and put it in the hole of the bobbin. Stick it over that, lock it into place. I'm going to loosen up my clutch there, and away it goes. See what's going on there. And then, if you just let this run, it will fill this bobbin up and automatically quit. I don't need that much thread tonight, so I'm just going to stop it now. And as you see, you just push that forward, it stops winding a bobbin. Now, we need to get our bobbin in the machine. And these are kind of neat because if you push down on this little deal here, that cover comes up, that flips out, and lift straight up out of the machine and then there's our bobbin case. We're going to take our bobbin case out, take my snips, there we go, and then if you notice the thread goes up in there like so and you always want it counterclockwise or the opposite direction. So you want your winding this direction because it's going to come out like so. And then make sure that you got it right And then leave a little pigtail, like so. And then just snap it right on back in. Now I finished reading the instructions on how to uh, thread the machine itself. And pretty typical of a 158, nothing majorly, majorly different. It's about the same. And uh, there's a few things we're going to need. First thing we're going to need is a needle. I have no needle. So let's see, we'll grab my tomato here. And if you notice, I take a tomato, and that's what I got all my needles in. And, you know, a size 14 will pretty much multi-purpose tonight. That's what we're going to use. And then you want to make sure that the flat part of the needle goes away from you and up into the machine. Like so. Got you back up on my camera stand so I can show you how to thread this. So I need to pull it back out because I was, of course, through winding a bobbin, and you got to go through this first pigtail, second pigtail, doop doop doop, piece of cake. Got you put back on the front, and now we need to run it through all this stuff here. Kind of confusing, but first thing we need to do is lift the foot, and you can do that with the deal on the back, the little lever, and then we're going to run it through our tension disc, up and under, lift straight up, into this guide, into the eyelet, into this guide, like so, and into that guide. So that's that part. Got you a close-up view of where the needle is, and then you'll see that there's a couple of guides there. So if you just bring your thread back, they just rest right on in there. And by this time, when I get there, I like to lower my foot, because if you lower the foot, it locks the tensions, and of course I can't pull tons of thread out. And then, 
through our needle. You can lift your foot back up, and just like so. Now we need to get our thread from our bobbin up into the machine, and the easiest way to do that is to spin the hand wheel. But wait, we were just spinning a bobbin, so it's a good idea that to tighten that clutch. And then I'm just going to spin it, and you hold onto the thread back here. See, I've got my hands on my thread, and I'm just going to bring it down, bring it up, and as you see, I have my foot up, and it brought my little thread up through the bottom there. And then I'm just going to take some, take a picture of that real quick. And then I'm just going to take my scissors or screwdriver or snips or whatever you got laying around and pull it back. Ta-da! We're threaded. Piece of cake. However, if you notice I have the straight stitch foot on here and the straight stitch plate. Now I'm going to run through all these stitches here so I'm gonna swap this plate out and I need the zigzag plate because of course you can't zigzag with this one in there and if you open up this magic box of goodies I have all sorts of things in here one of which is the zigzag plate piece of cake yeah look at that so to get this plate out and get this plate in we're going to have to pop the bottom of it off and sneak it out. So, if you reach your finger right up in here, you'll find that this is sitting up underneath there. So I'm going to take my bobbin back out. And that means you will have to pull your thread back up. And then I'm just going to push up on that little piece of metal that I feel. And it just pops right off. I found it's easier to get this off if there's no if there's no foot on the machine. And then the new one has a little groove right here that just drops right in there and you just push down on it. Piece of cake. And we'll reinsert our bobbin. And pull our thread back up almost ready to sew. Or has given us a small variety of feet. This machine's not loaded like a lot of the like the 1802s with boxes and tiers of stuff, but they give you some basics. They give you a, a nice little blind uh, a blind uh, stitch foot with a guide, shank. This would be the little knuckle system. I've got a video on my 1802 using this knuckle system and they make hemmers and all sorts of things that attach to this knuckle. It's a pretty slick deal. They give you a zipper foot, that's good for, you know, using, this This foot actually works for invisible zippers, standard zippers, uh, I've used it a couple of times, especially for in invisible zippers, a standard straight stitch foot, nothing fancy, and a standard zigzag foot, no, no groove, so it's just, it's not a uh, satin foot, it's just a standard zigzag, that's what we're putting on now. Here's my foot, and we need to get it here. And you will notice, and this is pretty typical of a lot of 158s, the extra lift. So you lift the foot, and it gives you so much clearance, but then you can pull it up just a little farther, and it gives you more clearance. That is a really handy feature. So if I stick my foot up underneath there, I don't quite have enough to get it finagled in there, and I don't really feel like pulling this nut out every single time. So that extra lift really comes in handy. You can literally lift... And drop your foot in and then I usually leave the feed dog down when I'm bolting it on and tighten your thumb nut down now you can use a screwdriver if you want to tighten it down that tight I'm not going to tighten it that tight because I have a hard time getting them back off I do change out my feet regularly and we're gonna lift this up and then this foot is actually got a cut right dead center and the that center cut does two things. It allows you to pull your thread through the foot, bring it back, and it also tells you that's where the center of the needle is going to be. This is a center center homing machine. One thing you want to check, this little doohickey up here, if you push the outer ring, it will pop up 
and it has a zero on it. Zero, one, two, three, and four. This is your pressure foot tension. The farther down it is, the more tension that this pressure foot will have against your material. And before you start sewing, zero is not a good place for it. Uh, that's pretty loose. It won't feed worth a spit. And then you'll wonder why your stitches are uneven or skipping. Or I usually run mine at about two for average. You don't, I don't change mine a whole lot. Sometimes if you're doing really heavy denim and it's a hard, having a hard time sucking it through, you'll increase or decrease, but it's a pretty slick deal. There's no screws like some of the other machines I've used, or you just push down on it and, oh, nope, that's too tight, so you just let go of it and go down to one, or maybe you need a little more, so you just push it a little more. Pretty slick. Checklist. Is it threaded properly? Maybe rewind, double check it. Is your thread pulled up? Is your bobbin snapped in? Is your foot tension about right? And then this is your upper tension. And I would recommend most Kenmores are pretty lenient on tension, but I usually start at around six or five. That's usually about right. Most of the machines that I work on and calibrate, I use two layers of muslin or two layers of cotton and adjust the lower tension until five or six on here. It looks perfect. So I'm gonna leave that at about five. Now we might want to put this thing back in there because this is kind of the flimsy weak part of the machine. So I'm going to drop this back in there and there are some grooves and they just sit right up in there like so and you close this. Now this actually extends the bed so you can leave this little box out and get a little bit more bed. And then for more grins, the side grayish, tannish, I don't know what color Kenmore calls this, it lifts up as well to extend the bed a little more. So now we have a bed. So, I'm on straight. It's on straight. I'm at the maximum length here. I finished reading the book to know what all these knobs do. Let's see if it works. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Let's see what we got. Drop your feet dog down. And it looks like I could come up a little bit on the upper tension because I can kind of see my bobbin, my top thread coming below through the top. But the top stitching looks really great. Now the fun part, let's run through its stitches. Okay, we got our machine threaded. We understand how that works. We got our tension about right. We're ready to start doing some cool stuff. So let's talk about these knobs. This is your stitch length. So that's the width of the stitch all the way up to zero where it'll just not move the material at all so that's the feed of the material there's a reverse for tacking or going backwards this is your zigzag the back and forth motion and this is the actual stitch selector right now it's on S so I'm gonna move it around and you can see that there's different things in there there's the right side of the buttonhole, the front and back of the buttonhole, the left side of the buttonhole, a blind stitch, a stretch stitch. I'm not sure what they call that one. I'd have to look in the book again. And a straight stitch. Now, if you want to do just a standard zigzag, you leave it on S and you just increase your width of the needle and it'll make you a nice little zigzag. And you say, wait a minute, that's kind of a wide zigzag. So let's uh, let's make it smaller. I want to go roughly 12 stitches per inch. I believe that's what that means. Get a back view of what this looks like. And that's 12. Let's go really fine. And then back to a really long six stitches per inch. Really cool. I like this little machine. And it's actually fairly powerful too. In fact, let's do that right now. How powerful this is. Now this isn't exactly denim. It's muslin. But I'm going to do... Four, six, 
8, 12. We're just going to do a sandwich of this stuff. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot. Especially for a three-quarter machine, that's a lot. We're going to stuff it underneath the foot and see what it does. And it goes right through it like hot butter. But wait a minute, we didn't touch our tension. I wonder if that's going to mess up our stitching. Well, let's take a look. We could use a little more tension. So if you ever get thicker material, you might want to increase or decrease your tension as you go. It's still not terrible. And that's, 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 a, that's a pretty good lump of stuff for an itty bitty little machine. The stretch stitch. Uh, that's the one where it's a little zigzag and it's perfect for if you're sewing, you know, working with knits or sewing with some, maybe putting a piece of elastic on and you need the stretchingness of the stitch itself. So let's see, I've got the dial set, I've got it at four. We're going to do a very long one. And the first thing you may notice is it does multiple hits. It's not just a standard zigzag. That's a pretty long one. I don't ever use it that long. So we're going to go down to about 12 here. That's about where I use it. And then, oddly enough, and I always forget they're there, but this little black deal up underneath here that you've noticed, it's a thread cutter. See, that looks really nifty. One more thing I want to do before I let you go. If yours is complete, it will have a bunch of these little plastic deals. And these are for making buttonholes. And they're kind of nifty because you don't have to have a special foot. You actually use the zigzag foot and you put this underneath it. So I want to demonstrate one of these. I've used them before. They're okay. I still like my templates and my plate, but I tell you what, this is for a little machine. This is a good way to do it. Set to the left side of the buttonhole. And one thing that you're going to want to do is your thread needs to come out from underneath this. And if, I, if you've already got your pigtails and things out, great. We'll just go ahead and stuff them through there like so. Okay, and it tells you that this is the rear, so it goes this direction. slide that up in there and remember see I can't get it up underneath there oh goodness it won't fit remember that extra lift that I was telling you about nope. look at that slides right up underneath there and then we're gonna drop our foot down in there see see how that fits right in there and then of course the foot grips and whatnot and make sure you get your threads pulled all the way through there don't get them wrapped around it like I just did Just did that because you only need to do the top thread not the bottom what am I doing goodness guess I need some more coffee here we'll get some more coffee real quick there we go pull them back so there we go I got my little footy in there I'm gonna take our material we're gonna put it in there we're going to snap it down. And you always want to start in the rear. And then I do believe we're going to set the stitch length to the red. So that way it's nice and tight. And then we're going to, yes, use the zigzag plate, the zigzag foot. Let's see what we get here. And we're going to run until we hit the front. Okay. Then we're going to flip our lever over to the front and back. I'll take a picture of it. And that should give us our back and forth. Oh, look at that. It is. I wish I could get a camera in here. Okay, and now that you've done that a couple of rounds over, 
you're going to flip your lever, your, your stitch selector again, to the right side. And then in theory, it should go back. Oh, look at that. That is so cool. And when you hit all the way back, you're going to remember the front and back button on the uh, knob. We're going to have to do that again. There it goes. And you know what? I like really strong buttonholes. I'm going to go through it again. a heck of a buttonhole. What a phenomenal job this little machine is. I'm kind of sad that I sold it today. This is why I decided to do a video editing, the video tutorial of it, because I had it listed, and I didn't really want to sell it, but this is, I mean, I've got 15 machines. How many of these things do I really need? And this was one of the nifty things that I just liked, because it's kind of neat. You don't see these too often. This video with finishing up a little project, so I'm going to put my straight stitch foot back on because that's what I need to finish this little project. And then, I'm a real stickler. I have these things, these guides. This is my favorite guide, and I absolutely love this guide. They're very common. I find them in the thrift stores. They come in machines, and I'm not sure exactly where they came from. If they were an aftermarket deal, there's no numbers, but I probably have about 10 of these. This machine actually had no guide holes. I mean, there's nowhere to put an actual guide, and the magnetic ones that you buy are, they're pretty crappy. I don't like them. So I actually took the needle plate off and drilled and tapped a hole so I could put a guide on it. I'll slide you over. See that little hole right there? And I like this one because it's indented right there for a zigzag machine, so it doesn't, your feed dogs don't drag on it. Put my thumb screw in there, and I like this because it gives me a really, really, really close seam. And we're gonna conclude with a scrunchie. I'm gonna finish up my last scrunchie from my huge run, and you'll under, you'll understand why. So I'm gonna go back to a straight stitch because this isn't a fancy, fancy ordeal. And you can straight stitch with the zigzag foot, uh, needle plate in. But if you're doing lots and lots of it, or lightweight cottons, or really lightweight materials, you may want to go ahead and put in the straight stitch plate. For example, when I was making, I made mm, 200 of these on this machine last week. And I figured if I'm making that many, and most of it's all, and it was all straight stitching, I went ahead and just put the straight stitch plate on. seem like it was hot butter. machine is very heavy. So I'm going to use my backpacking. Hey. One more scrunchie for the pile. It's time. Now we're finished with our mini Kenny and it's time to pack it up. So, and I took a picture of this. There's a little deal underneath this side. I'm going to pull it forward and you push that down. You go like that push a little piece right here and that flips up that flips over and down I'm gonna make sure my foot's lifted up and I can take my thread right out and if you like you can leave your bobbin thread in there 
push the pin down, turn off the power, unplug the machine. Now we gotta finagle it back into the case. And one thing I've noticed when you go to put it in the case, feed dogs have to be down. It will not go in the case if this lever is popping out the back. So we have to make sure you drop that down. I've got my case again. I'm gonna push my little buttons on the side, open it back up. Slide it around the back of the machine, over the front of the machine. That's it. You're ready to go home with it. For watching my video, if you have questions on this machine, please leave a comment under the video or hit us up on our Facebook at So Saves Me. And uh, yeah, have a good evening.